Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining the Society for Clinical Research Sites for our Good Technical Practices webinar. Today's presentation is Competing Against the Sightless Future. Are you ready? And our presenters today are Amanda Wrangle and Kim Kundert from Virtrial, one of our GIPs. They'll be, you'll, you'll be able to meet with them at the Global Site Solutions Summit and I believe at Asia Pacific as well. Is that true? Oh, you're on mute. There you are. This year. I'm sorry, can you re repeat that again? Your phone was kind of uh, crackly. I said, yes, that is true. We'll be at both this year. All right, very good. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you there. For more information on all of our webinars and all of our member benefits, please visit us at myscrs.org and browse to the Members Only tab. Immediately following today's presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a survey. In order for you to successfully receive your contact hour credit, you must be logged into WebEx as an individual, remain present for the webinar in its entirety, and complete the post-webinar survey. If these three requirements are met, you will receive a contact hour certificate via email within 30 days. There is no contact hour credit offered for listening to the recording of this presentation. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature that can be found at the bottom right of your WebEx window, and our presenters will do their best to answer the questions during the presentation. This webinar will continue for approximately one hour, and we're happy to turn it over to Kim and Amanda from Virtrial. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Competing Against the Sightless Future. Are you ready? Here's our disclosure statement. We'll go back here and do introductions, I believe. So my name is Amanda Rangel. I'm currently VP of Business Development for Virtrial, a telemedicine company focused on the clinical trial industry. I've spent over 15 years working in sites wearing numerous hats. I started my journey, as many of us do, as a coordinator and in patient recruitment and moved into business development, most recently heading the global sales team for Synexis, which is formerly Radiant Research. Great. Thanks, Amanda. I'm Kim Kundert. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Virtrial. And very much like Amanda, um, I started um, as a coordinator as well and worked um, within the Clinical Research Advantage, Radiant, and Synexis um, site networks where I learned a lot about enrollment and the challenges that come with enrolling patients and then keeping them on trial and until the end. So part of what we want to talk about today is um, Amanda's going to go into the objectives, but just really um, stating that we understand your pains and where you're coming from and have tried to, tried to take that um, with us going forward in, in what we're doing today. Great. So I always like to lead with objectives. What are our objectives today? We, number one, want to identify what a sightless clinical trial is and the terminology being used within the industry. Number two, identify technology that will increase sites' competitive edge. And three, learn how to utilize tools to remain sustainable and grow your site business. And for purposes of the webinar, we have included some icon stars, which designates a site tip or resource, and these slides will be available to attendees afterwards so you can uh, pick through and see where we may have provided some resources to further follow up on. So why the hype about virtual clinical trials in the first place? Well, we're going to begin our journey together today. Much as Kim said, we have worked in sites and understand the challenges to enrollment. So here is an all too relatable example. You find a perfect patient uh, spending weeks, months, sometimes even a, an entire year to find that perfect patient. And then they are going to be on vacation during certain visits required within the protocol. So they opt to not participate in the study. This is just one of the many examples of why patients don't participate in clinical trials. And if you're experiencing this, you're not alone. These are common issues for the industry as a whole. So here we've provided feedback from patients surveyed by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in collaboration with Syscript and Cornell University. And the main concerns patients had when surveyed 
is about having to take a lot of time off work for appointments and or the greater burdens on their family. Because as we know, oftentimes family members and caregivers also need to be enrolled into the trial to keep the patient engaged and compliant. Patients also did not want to have to spend a lot of time traveling to receive treatment. This includes time spent in individual appointments and much highlighted in this survey was uh, specifically for lab work. Also, scheduling flexibility was found to be important, such as being able to make appointments after work hours or on the weekend. Those of you, all of us, have busy lives. We either work, we have kids, we have other obligations. So this is extremely important to have that flexibility in scheduling options. And the most frequent negative comments regarded a dislike for the long wait times that people had to spend doing laboratory visits or in pharmacies to participate in the trial. And there is a reference here if you'd like to look more in depth at the survey conducted. So what does this all translate to in terms of the cost to our industry? Here are a few standard statistics that we hear time and again in the news. We all know 80% of trials fail to meet initial targets. It takes about $50,000 to initiate a single study site, yet 33% of sites actually fail to enroll a single patient in a trial. And the cost to pharma is uh, $37,000 each day a trial is delayed, which is clearly a not insignificant number. In a standard phase three trial, we find an average 30% dropout rate. And unfortunately, these statistics are um, specific to America, um, but they're very similar across the rest of the world. Less than 5% of Americans actually participate in trials. And this is just the cost in dollars. As patient care experts, think about the lost time this means for those depending on the development of new therapies. To a patient, this may ultimately mean the difference in having treatment options available to them or not. So we've identified the problem. Patients aren't enrolling in trials and it's delaying drug development. And this is not a new problem. We're all aware of this. So what are we as an industry doing to find solutions to address it? Some companies, as you can see from this slide, have started to solve this problem with entirely virtual or sightless trials. This vision changes the traditional trial paradigm of patients traveling to brick and mortar trial sites, as depicted within the picture on the left-hand side of this slide, to a model with either a single meta site or no sites as, at all, as depicted in the picture on the right. What are some of the attributes of a sightless trial? As implied by the name, this model eliminates reliance on independent research sites completely, and 100% of visits are conducted virtually. Other terms for it have included direct-to-patient, decentralized clinical trials, and remote trials, among some others. For the patients, what does this look like? Well, their experience is almost, if not entirely, virtual. So typically, they will go to a website to pre-screen and complete online questions. They'll complete a remote consent form and enroll themselves in the trial. And then study supplies and investigational product is shipped in a box to the patient's address. Study in a box. It's a study <laughs> in a box. As in all things, there are some challenges to this model. So realistically, very few protocols can be designed without the need for in-person visits. There's also a trade-off in relieving the travel burden on patients. They are often overwhelmed with the technology requirements needed to support remote participation. As well, it removes the intrinsic value patients find in developing a relationship with their study team and healthcare provider. This is something we know very well, uh, being on the site side, that a lot of patients participate because of that relationship 
um, that they have with their care team. And lastly, although not a lot has been done to date, some early 100% virtual studies have shown that while enrollment does happen very quickly, patients are very engaged in social media and excited when first approached to do this type of trial. However, a high level of patients actually have dropped out before completing the study due to that lack of in-person engagement or just um, they become disinterested or the technology is too burdensome. Now, despite the limitations that we just went over, please don't ignore the potential of this future reality. If you're a site, this slide is your call to action. These companies here didn't believe that technology would put them out of business, and look what happened to them. Blockbuster was overrun by online streaming, and Uber and Lyft are taking over the yellow taxi cab. So in this virtual world, it really is time as a site to educate yourselves on what is needed to sustain your site in the future. And if you're on this webinar, it's a very good place to start. Definitely don't underestimate the power you have as a site. Site organizations like SCRS are here to support you. Together, um, we can have a collective voice as a site community, and definitely don't be afraid to use that voice. So to that end, let's think about an alternative uh, to a sightless future. So we'll go back to our first example. You spend all that time and you find the perfect patient, and they can't accommodate the visit requirements. So let's think, what if you could replace just some of the visits within a protocol with remote visits? This is and can be our alternative future, a hybrid virtual trial model. This combines in-person visits to maintain the human element that's so important to patients participating in trials, but it gives flexibility to the patient when they don't actually need to come to the clinic. This is both a site and patient-friendly uh, model, and by having this capability, your site can compete against the siteless, siteless future and um, not go down the path of the blockbuster and taxis um, that we've seen being overrun. So with that, hopefully we've met our first objective of uh, identifying what a sightless trial is and going over some of the other names for it. And I will now hand over to Kim, who can go over some of the attributes of hybrid trials and what's available to you as a site. Great. Thanks, Amanda. So I want to have you think a little bit more about a hybrid virtual trial and where it's been used in the past, where we're at now, and where it could potentially go in the future. So if we think back to historically and using many of the different terminology that's out there, it's probably, you could think of examples relating to more of direct to patients where think about maybe those influenza trials that we did where the patients would have uh, be too sick to come in to the clinic and the pharma company would provide home health that could go to their go to their home and collect blood or do swabs or whatever would be needed. Um, but historically, this has not been incorporated as an ongoing option within the protocol. So. If we try to advance a little bit, we can look at what the current state is, and we do see that some sponsors are using home phlebotomy as a component, but they're not really thinking about it any further than that. So we're, we'd like to encourage sponsors to think outside the box a little bit more and think of what are the additional things that you could have home health do besides just phlebotomy or blood work. So um, we have been talking with some rare disease groups and realize now that they're actually helping with um, the administration of the investigational product, which could be um, oral or it could be an injection or something that the home health goes there for a short amount of time to teach the patient how to use it and then kind of um, wean off their um, visits from there. Um, the other things that they're doing is uh, EKGs and also providing training and support for caregivers. Um, such as those uh, trials with Alzheimer's that, that need that support. But if we look at what 
currently is available for technology and maybe thinking into the future. There's a lot of technology that's available and you've probably seen some of these things being incorporated into trials such as e-consent, um, but we also have like the wearables that are starting to become um, more prevalent with the Apple Watch and now the Cardia Band, which has been FDA cleared for ECG collection. Um, there's also telemedicine, which um, we will go into a little bit more detail. And there's also some technology such as apps and different things that can measure um, patients' movements, such as Parkinson's tremor or uh, measuring their gait and balance. So one of the things that I want, uh, want you to think about is we hear a lot of things about patient centricity and um, hear the industry using that term and think pharma uses that term a lot, but not sure if they are actually thinking of it in terms of which clinical trials would best support the patient for remote visit. Um, they might be more thinking about what data can I collect with this awesome new technology, but um, as we all know, we really need to think about what, what helps the patient the most. So what areas could potentially be um, a hybrid or remote trials be done in? Well, probably not uh, phase one or first in human trials because those are inpatient and you have, um, you know, need the, the patient to be there at the clinic with the physician oversight. Um, other examples would probably be where you need uh, special equipment, such as an MRI or a CT scan, or trials where they have infrequent site visits. But on the other hand, think about trials that uh, have maybe very frequent visits, and are they really needed? Is it really needed that the patient come to the clinic to complete that visit or that collect that data? Um, your cardiovascular outcome studies or maybe long-term follow-up for uh, your vaccine trials. Um, also, again, going back to that caregiver involvement because we know how hard it is to get, um, you know, our patients that have um, ambulatory or transportation things to consider and then throwing caregiver involvement into that, then you're trying to get coordinate visits with two people to come in. Um, or such uh, instances where patients live uh, a long distance from the investigative site. So, you might be thinking, what would this look like if we tried to implement it into a protocol? So, um, we've actually been working with a couple of rare disease advocacy groups, and um, they're very forward thinking, and what we did is we made the protocol very flexible and taking a proactive approach and it was the decisions left up to the patient on whether they want to visit the clinic um, where you know maybe they they don't live far away and they want to come in and have that connection um, but we evaluated which particular visits could be done remotely and looking at um, ones where you're just checking study med compliance how is the patient doing um, going over aes and con meds and then there were simple blood draws. And so for this particular protocol, um, the patient was given the option to go to a local lab to complete the blood draw instead of going into the clinic. So what, what does this mean for you? If, if you can work with pharma, because obviously bringing this up, we can't incorporate any of this unless this flexible language is actually incorporated or written into the protocol. So you're probably thinking, all of this sounds fantastic, but will patients participate? So we actually have a few statistics here um, because we wondered the same thing. So 87% of patients actually want to participate in relevant clinical trials. So it's not really a lack of motivation. Um, one of the main factors, as we all know, is that of those patients that were pulled, um, 70% of them lived more than two hours away from the nearest study center. And when those patients were asked, uh, would they participate in a virtual research visit or um, home-based visits, uh, more than half of them said they would, it would increase their likelihood of them participating in a trial if they had some options. So you're probably thinking in your head, okay, I have some patients I think that would work for, but there's some patients who may not. So we wanted to give you some statistics to think about and um, 
we're a very um, mobile society these days, and it's not just the younger generation, the 20 and 30 year olds that, um, that are on their phones. So take a look at some of these statistics. I think you'll find them pretty staggering. Um, this first one I thought was quite interesting that if you look worldwide, there's more people that own a cell phone than a toothbrush. I'm not sure what that says about our society, but <laughs> we're very uh, technical. Um, and a couple other statistics, the average person spends five hours a day on their smartphone. Um, over 50% of people grab their smartphone immediately after waking up, and the average person checks their phone every 10 minutes. So as you can see by these statistics, it's, it's saying the average. This is including all people. Um, so think about that. Think about if you have the potential to communicate with your study patients, uh, maybe via text to send them reminders in, in a HIPAA-compliant manner. Um, think about what that might do to um, your engagement and retention with, with your patients. So what I want to talk about right now is um, in continuing with the hybrid virtual model, um, we want to make you aware of some of the technologies that are available. Some you may be a little bit more familiar with than others. Um, specifically, um, e-consent. Uh, you've probably heard of it. Um, I feel like it's being incorporated into more protocols, but um, everybody's probably wondering, you know, is there evidence to suggest that e-consent um, patients may have a better understanding or comprehension of the actual protocol and what they're signing up for? So um, we've actually attached an article here, um, as you can see denoted with the star, um, if you want to read more details about it, but I'm just going to go over it very briefly for you because I thought this was quite interesting. Um, so back to the question, do patients have a better understanding of trial or the trial when the e-consent versus the traditional paper is used? This uh, particular study did show that yes, um, in a study, uh, randomized study participants were divided into two groups. One used paper consent and the other used e-consent. Both groups were asked to return to a website 24 to 36 hours later and answer questions about what they had learned um, about reading about the study. Um, the paper users recalled 58% of the information correctly, while the e-consent users recalled 75% correctly. Um, so I think that's quite, um, quite uh, the difference in, in the two methods. Um, and I think it's that, you know, with e-consent, there's visuals and different things that can be used, and sometimes they'll incorporate uh, comprehension questions. So. Um, Hopefully, we can think about these things and use them to uh, improve the understanding of patients as well as participation. Um, we all have heard about the wearables and the, the mobile apps um, that are out there. And then, of course, telemedicine, where you could conduct remote video visits um, or even, as I mentioned, send secure text messages or emails that you could potentially give the patient more information about their um, indication or the therapeutic area that you're discussing and uh, help them to become uh, more educated about their condition. So because our area is um, expert, our area of expertise is telemedicine, we're going to go into that just a little bit further here. So you're probably wondering what is telemedicine? So you hear about it, it's been in healthcare for the last 10 years. Uh, you may even uh, visit your primary care physician uh, remote, remotely through telemedicine. Um, so we just took the definition from the American Telemedicine Association website, and we've provided that here for you if you wanted to look into further detail on your own. But the definition is technology-enabled health and care management and delivery systems that extend capacity and access. Um, and it can take a few different forms, which we have listed here. So it can be a live video conference, which um, another term is synchronous. And that's really the live interactive consultation that we probably most think about when we hear of telemedicine. Um, but there's other methods and forms that telemedicine can take. It can include the transmission of diagnostic images um, or other data points such as vital signs or a video clip, such as a, a movement or um, motion data. There's also remote patient monitoring, and that's where a device is used to remotely collect and send data. 
um, either to a home health agency or remote diagnostic um, facility. And then last is the mobile health, and that's mostly um, been consumer medical and health information um, using the internet. And as we know, more of those consumer um, medical devices are trying to make their way into the clinical trial industry, which I think would be uh, helpful and beneficial for all of us. Okay, so now that we have the definition, I um, wanted to let you know basically what does it look like. So um, this is just an example of, of a status page. So within uh, a telemedicine system, you can initiate a contact or call to the patient for remote visit. So this is the status showing you that you're connecting to the patient. When you're actually connected, um, this is what you will see. So you'll see an image of the patient. And then in the upper right hand corner, you can see you'll have a picture of yourself, the coordinator conducting the visit along with the patient. Um, and one thing to think about, uh, advantage that video chats have over telephone calls is you can actually see the patient. So even though the patient might tell you, you might say, okay, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? And they might say that they're fine or that they're doing okay, but you might be able to tell from their face that Maybe they're flushed or maybe they're very pale. Um, that would lead you to ask further questions to, to try to figure out what was really going on. Um, another feature that I really like about being able to see the patient, and, and I've used this a lot in, in my uh, years of conducting clinical trials, is when you're explaining something or trying to educate the patient on uh, completion of the diary or taking their study medication, you can see their facial expression, so you can gauge whether they're really understanding what it is that you're saying, or do they have that blank look on their face and you're kind of like, okay, let's go over that again and maybe explain it in a little bit different manner so that they understand and you have a compliant patient, which makes us all happy. So this is just one other view. Um, it will show shows the single coordinator um, to a patient view. That's what uh, the patient sees. And then on the right side is an example if uh, there's a potential for multi-way calling. So you could pull in um, up to eight different people on a call. Uh, not sure that you would need that many, but the, the capacity is there. And this is uh, the sample of what it would look like to bring a physician in. So maybe your physician, uh, you and the patient are talking and the patient starts presenting with some um, adverse events or something serious and you want to pull the PI in and maybe the PI is on vacation in, I don't know, Bermuda. Um, you can <laughs> click, on, click on that plus sign that we saw and that will pull, pull the physician into the call. Now, of course the patient still has, or the physician still has to answer the call, but the potential to connect with, with him or her is, is there. So I mentioned a couple of features that I liked about the telemedicine and that you can actually see the patient um, instead of you know, see their face through the video chat as opposed to just a telephone call. So it not only has that advantage, but we put some statistics up here because um, I'm sure as coordinators, you're, you're well aware of this, um, that most patients preferred method of communication is no longer telephone. They're no longer answering the phone. Um, in fact, some of the statistics that show that uh, over a third of patients only um, don't even listen to their email and, or sorry, their voicemail. And when they do, um, they usually wait for three or more days to even check it. So you probably have those um, those reminders or those piles of charts that like, okay, I need to call that patient again tomorrow because they didn't answer. So, you know, think about if you can send them a text to say, hey, are you taking your medication? Um, have you missed any doses? How are you feeling? You know. Um, something like that where it's a method of communication you know that they're more likely to um, reply to or say, hey, uh, you missed your visit, let's uh, reschedule. And instead of going back and forth playing phone tag, you could um, communicate via text message. So um, I, again, just trying to encourage you to use your site voice. Um, as Amanda said, we have, we have a collective site voice and we want to include um, this in protocols and, and, and encourage pharma to um, write this flexible language into the protocols, including the video chats. So um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Amanda and she's gonna go over some tips on what you should actually be looking for in the protocols and studies that, that you're receiving every day.
Great. Thanks, Kim. And I'll just take a brief pause and give everyone a reminder that there is a Q&A uh, section on the webinar. So if you have questions that come up during our um, dialogue, please don't hesitate to, to put a question in there and we'll leave some room at the end for answering those questions. Okay, so Kim, thank you very much for giving that overview of hybrid uh, clinical trials as well as the technologies that can be involved to enable a hybrid clinical trial model. So as a site, I want to go over when you're looking at technology to support your site and your sustainability in this future virtual world. Here are some of the patient-centric features that we recommend that can support the success of a hybrid trial model. And first of all, and there's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of discussion and dialogue on this point, but bring your own device, or as shown on this slide, BYOD. Uh, this certainly has its benefits and it has some challenges, but when looking at technology, see if it can be run on any device. So a lot of these technologies, such as e-diary, need to have a provision device, or the technologies only run on an Apple phone, again, needing to provision the device. So if it can run on any, either an iPhone, an Android, a tablet, a computer, you can imagine this makes it a lot easier on the patient because they're already used to the technology. They know how their phone works. They know how their computer works. So it eases that burden on them of having to try to learn something new and not just learn something new, but also carry something additional around. If they're not listening to their voicemails or answering the phone as it is, I'm certain that they won't do it if they have a second device that is not theirs. So that is, that is one. Um, I do want to pause on the bring your own device uh, concept, though, because we've had a lot of questions on, you know, what are some of the, the privacy concerns or the additional costs that could be incurred to the patient? And so we'll, we'll go through a couple of these. Costs associated with um, the data plan for a patient to use a bring, uh, bring your own device, it really does need to be addressed in compensation strategies and made clear to the patient. So in other words, it needs to be put in the stipend as well as in the consent form so that the patient is clear on what this um, means to them. Patients can also, if this is an option for the technology, they can opt for the web version, which is powered by Wi-Fi, so that uh, eliminates the need for the data plan. Privacy-wise, there are agreements um, with the patient on the use of technology risks. And when it comes to IRBs, most central IRBs are actually supportive of bring your own device. And interestingly enough, patients like it more too. They feel that they're more secure than provision devices, and they don't need to, as I already mentioned, um, they don't like carrying around a second device just for the study. So there's just some proactive um, answers to your questions on bring your own device. I know that there's many more. Uh, again, please feel free to use the Q&A section. So back to some of the technology features that we find patient-centric. Uh, equipped with a variety of communication modalities. So if we're talking about a telemedicine platform, as Kim just went over, great to have the, the video conferencing, but to relieve the burden on you as a site and a coordinator, if you could automate some of the emails and text message reminders, um, that significantly relieves that burden of the manual process on you where you know they're being reminded for an appointment, they're being reminded to complete their e diary, or they're being reminded to um, take their study medication as prescribed, and you don't need to pick up the phone and make 10 phone calls just to get that done. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Another technology feature is um, to allow a multi-way calling. So if we are going to enable remote visits, uh, we don't want to limit it to just a, an interface between the coordinator and the patient. If you as a coordinator are talking to the patient, and perhaps they're presenting with some AAE symptoms and you would like to pull in the, the principal investigator or another physician that is working on the 
study, and perhaps they're not in the clinic that day. A lot of them may be doing rounds at a different clinic or at a hospital. Look for that feature that allows you to pull them in so that you can maintain that um, PI oversight at all times um, for the patient. And then uh, another question that comes up a lot is, you know, for, for, for technologies such as e-consent, can it be available and delivered in multiple language? Um, so our tip here is definitely make sure this is an option when reviewing vendors, uh, that it can be translated into multiple languages. As well, an additional um, feature that we've seen that can be very beneficial is, is there an option, let's say you are doing a, a remote video chat, to pull in a medically certified interpreter uh, to that video chat. That way, if um, the, for example, hospital staff does not speak Mandarin, you can pull in a medically certified translator to be able to um, assist with that visit. These are some of the patient-centric um, benefits. But we didn't forget about you. So what about these <laughs> sites? There we go. So we can definitely commiserate and acknowledge the challenges to adopting new technology. It's not easy to do, and sometimes it becomes quite burdensome. But here are some of the benefits that sites can glean from embracing the, embracing the capability uh, of technologies to conduct hybrid trials. So um, if you think about it, this can enable more efficient site visits and in the end, increase capacity for your site. It takes quite a bit of time to check a patient into the clinic, bring them back, meet with them face to face. And if this is a simple visit and the time needed to conduct the visit can be reduced by doing a remote video chat, you can in turn do more visits and more timely visits um, sitting at your desk, of course, in an environment to protect PHI, but it improves the site efficiency. And the bring your own device model, again, it has its patient benefits, but um, you don't have another box of devices to store that you don't have room for on site and um, serving as tech support for when the helpline is in a different country or doesn't speak our language or isn't 24 hour support. So you end up serving as tech support for these devices as well. And then if the patient's run off with the device, trying to track them down, calling your mandatory three times and sending a certified letter, all of this can, can be um, reduced uh, by having a bring your own device model. Also, for reporting adverse events, having more frequent patient contact allows you to have more real-time reporting of adverse events, and this is a win-win for, for everyone involved. And then improving enrollment compliance and retention. If you have happy patients, they stay compliant, they stay on the study, and this increases your bottom line as a study site because we, we, lose, um, the, we lose the opportunity to be profitable if our patients aren't staying on the studies. And then what more could you want but happier site staff? Uh, you reduce that study burnout. Uh, and by you know having it easier to to conduct remote visits on the coordinators. Now, if you're finding yourself thinking of certain patients that might not be able to use this technology, Kim mentioned uh, a few stats earlier. Um, we we get nervous that the older patients, especially, can't um, use the technology. We actually conducted a pilot study. This was specific to our telemedicine platform, but we wanted to purposely test it in various age groups uh, of patients with different research experience, so either research naive or uh, having been a, a study participant before. And we even included less than ideal Wi-Fi connectivities to see if there were challenges with patients that maybe were more rural or didn't have a great Wi-Fi connectivity. So the site tip here that we're providing on this page is that uh, there is quite a diversity of ages. And, and yes, we found in this particular study that all age groups are embracing it. It's on their own device after all. 
In fact, we found that all patients on this study rated the ease of use at 97%. And it was a very simple study. Uh, basically, it consisted of one in-person visit to consent and to download the app onto each patient's personal mobile device. And then it had two subsequent remote video chats between the patient and a designated clinical research coordinator. And both were uh, asked to provide feedback, both the coordinator and the patient. And we found that it was easier, very easy to use. Some of the specific feedback that was received, uh, across the top we have the site feedback. Remote visits are much more convenient and less maintenance than in-person visits. Again, going back to that, that point of increased efficiency of the site. The site liked the ease of use and they think the app can be beneficial in enrolling patients as well as retaining them. And for the patient's perspective, the first patient said ease of participation and not traveling to, to the site too many times is a benefit of this type of technology, as well as convenient for patients that can't drive or live far from a site. And Kim showed an interesting statistic earlier that 70% of patients live actually two hours or more from the study site. And then another one was very enthusiastic, great to know that research could soon be done remotely. So this is very encouraging feedback that it is being embraced and patients are ready for it. So we've talked now about the site and patient benefits of technologies that enable hybrid clinical trials, but we do want to touch on sponsors well, not to leave them out. Um, this is really a win-win for all in the industry as a whole. So we talked earlier about retention um, as a problem. And here's some data that we found. In a standard phase three trial, there is a average dropout rate of 30%. The cost of this is about $5,000 per drop patient. And this is just for the drop patient. It doesn't include adding patients to uh, make up for that as well as potentially adding sites. And then we find a similar non-compliance rate of 30 to 35% in the trial and about $450 per non-compliance episode. So if we want to quantify what this means to the sponsors, if we take a 5,000 patient study and a dropout rate of 30%, that means 1,500 patients will drop from that trial. This equates to, at $5,000 per patient, about $7.5 million in dropout costs. And as I mentioned, it doesn't account for the cost of replacing those patients as well as adding sites. So there is a significant benefit to coming up with a solution to increase that retention and compliance in a trial. And um, some other virtual clinical trials that we've looked at um, have shown as little as a 3 to 5% dropout rate. So there's a lot of work to be done in this space to further validate some of these statistics, but the, the potential is there. And so, uh, again, I'll mention a win-win for the industry as a whole. So I'll hand back over to Kim. We've included in the slide deck some site resources that you can review, and as these slides are given to all of the attendees, look up these resources as well as you, if you'd like to learn more. So there certainly isn't enough time in an hour to go through all of these in depth. But Kim, I'll hand over to you so that you can give an overview of what is available out there in the industry. Yeah, thank you. So one of the resources that we wanted to point out is the um, Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, or CTTI, actually did a project uh, in 2017, I believe, um, where they came, had industry professionals from varying uh, backgrounds come together and they created some terms around um, and, and guidelines around um, adopting. And their term that they've used in their project was decentralized clinical trials. So it's really exploring more of the legal, regulatory, and practical considerations of what is actually required to do a decentralized clinical trial. 
And uh, we've shared though that resource here. Um, knowing that this is something that we're actually encountering every day, um, we actually have sponsors coming to us to say, how, how do I incorporate this language into a protocol or a consent or where do we even start? So as Amanda mentioned, like the, the technology is there, the potential is there, we just need to work on creating the path and, and incorporating the language that is needed to kind of give guidance. So um, Virta has actually been working on standard protocol and ICF template language for these hybrid virtual trials um, in response to this request. And um, as we mentioned, um, there's a star on here because this is a tip for you as well to kind of go back to the resources to educate yourself a little bit more so that you're aware of, of the terminology and what things you should be looking for and um, using your voice to communicate with sponsor. Um, so the next slide is essentially just some more um, site resources to basically help yourself remain sustainable. Um, groups that are focusing on the patient centricity. There's several organizations out there. Um, we've listed some here for you. Um, the FDA is uh, actually very much embracing um, patient centricity and virtual um, hybrid trials. Um, there's also a few other groups that we've listed here. Um, you can tell sponsor and CROs are thinking about um, telemedicine and patients and patient centricity because many of those companies have created new whole new departments and assigned people to have roles that are focused on patient advocacy, patient engagement, uh, digital innovation, all of those things. Um, and even the IRBs are trying to work on standard consent language to help pharma, to help sites. And uh, we've listed one of the IRBs here that I know has some uh, consent templates here. And um, lastly, uh, think about the trade organizations as well. Um, the Society for Clinical Research Sites is actually um, exploring the impact of clinical trial technologies on research. And they have also launched a digital innovative initiative. Um, really, they want to provide um, member sites with digital intelligence and allow you that competitive advantage in the marketplace. Um, there's also increased awareness and increased prevalence of training competencies around technology. Um, we're aware of ACRP partnering with technology service providers um, really to enhance the competency of their members um, to use a vast array of new and promising technologies. Um, so, so just a, a final thought is the future of clinical research, we all know, must include site-centric technology. But together, the site community can provide the leadership needed to improve the patient experience through the utilization of forward-thinking technology solutions. So it looks like we have maybe about 10 minutes left, so we can take some um, question and answer at this time. Um, as a reminder, there's a Q&A chat on the bottom of your screen, bottom right hand, and um, it looks like there might be um, a couple in there. So yes, we have one question so far. Um, you mentioned earlier in the presentation that retention is a problem in remote trials, but later indicate a lot of participants prefer the benefits of remote trials. So have you teased out or do you know why participants in remote trials leave the study? This is a great question. I can start the answer, uh, Kim, if you'd like to, to add. So earlier on in the presentation, we mentioned retention as a problem in completely 100% virtual trials, which do not involve participants traveling to a research site. And there are a couple specific examples that come to mind uh, for myself is uh, the first virtual sightless study that was ever done is the Pfizer uh, was called the remote. remote. Okay, <laughs> easy enough to remember. The Pfizer remote trial, and this was in um, subjects or participants with overactive bladder. 
And basically, for this particular study, uh, there were there are lots of issues. The trial design caused the trial to to actually fail because it had patients enroll offline and never visit trial sites. And for that reason, Pfizer was never able to enroll enough patients as well as retain the patients. So it was very complicated and te tedious. It made it a very uneasy for patients to be willing to put so much of their medical information online. And without the guidance of experts and medical professionals that you find in a site, subjects were just simply were unsure of what they needed to do. Uh, so that is one example, again, that's called the Pfizer Remote Study. And I can add just a little bit more to that. Um, from what I read um, as well, there were e-diaries that the patients had to use for this particular trial. And imagine um, there was no face-to-face uh, -face interaction, so nobody, they didn't have any in-clinic visits where that diary and use of the diary um, could be walked through with a patient, could it be explained um, more thoroughly, and if you think about maybe the population for an overactive bladder uh, study, um, you know, you're probably going to have 50-plus-year-old uh, women um, that are using this. So, um, as Amanda mentioned, that was 100% virtual, and where it could be beneficial to have a, a hybrid virtual trial is that, you know, the first visit could be done in person, or they would have maybe, you know, three or four visits in person where they could have the opportunity to learn how to use the device. They would have connection with a coordinator or somebody that could answer questions about that. And, um, and that was part of the reason that they had really poor um, retention. Thank you, Kim. I'll throw out one more study example there uh, if, if you'd like to look it up after this webinar. But GSK also did a sightless study called Parade. And this study, was actually uh, it enrolled, and it was something like almost 400 participants enrolled in very record time. However, after 12 weeks, only 50 of the participants were still using the app. So this shows, again, just kind of reiterating that human element that convenience alone is not enough to keep patients happy on a trial. There is that middle ground of establishing the relationship, having the in-person support needed in addition to the flexibility. And that is why our motto and uh, advice for the site is to really promote and look at that hybrid clinical trial model, which is the best of both worlds. And then there's one more question. I think we have time for one more. Has the FDA been receptive to this type of study design? And we're going to both probably at the same time give an enthusiastic yes. Yeah. They are encouraging this more than you can believe. Um, there has actually been, and I believe it was on a, a like the earlier slide right there. that that Kim had showed, but if you look up and you can simply Google the uh, first bullet point here, Patient Engagement Advisory Committee, as well as the fourth bullet on decentralized clinical trial thoughts, um, there are significant advocacy within the FDA to, to promote and have companies be innovative towards this type of design. So everything is encouraging. It is here and it is coming. And um, again, win-win overall for the industry as a whole. Yep. Yep. Should we have five minutes? Are there any other questions that we can answer? I don't have any more coming to me. Um, okay. Everybody's tired from it's the first day back after holiday. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. Uh, well, do you have any other closing comments? Are you ready to? Oh, I, I would just add that if you want to learn more about uh, Virtile, then we have a, actually have a link. As, as Mike mentioned before, we are a, a global impact partner for SCRS, so you can um, read more about us on their website. Yes, they can. Thanks very much um, for all attendees. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you very much for your, your time today, and thanks again to Kim and Amanda over at Virtrials. Uh, for the attendees, please complete the post-webinar survey and evaluation that will follow today's presentation 
as you close out of WebEx to receive your contact hour credit. For more on good technology, business, clinical, and oncology practices and other topics, see the SCRS Insight Journal. We publish that quarterly for members. You can see that in the members section of our website, myscrs.org. Again, we invite everyone to register for the upcoming Asia Pacific and Global Site Solution Summits this year. Seats are limited and we usually sell out. We appreciate everyone's participation in today's program. I look forward to having you join us for more webinars in the coming year. Today's session has been recorded. I'll be forwarding a link out to the recording within the next 24 hours. We look forward to everyone's feedback. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.